Amen. So in 2 Samuel chapter number 7 there, uh, probably a pretty familiar story about when the uh, David starts to lay the groundwork, or at least has the intent to build the temple for the Lord. And I think there's some, you know, some lessons we can learn from this about humility, about, you know, uh, making sure that we have, you know, good motivations when it comes to serving God. And, you know, right out of the gate here in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. So you can see David's heart here in the beginning, where he's saying, you know, hey, look, I'm in this house of cedars. You know, I've built this nice house for me. God's established my kingdom. Things are going well. And he gets this burden for the Ark of the Covenant. You know, he gets the burden for the Ark of God, the fact that it's dwelling within curtains, talking about the fact that it's still in the tabernacle, which was God's original intent. You know, God, uh, we're going to see here in a minute, he goes on and explains to David, look, and I, at no time did I say, hey, build me a house. Right? He was perfectly content with having his ark in a tabernacle because, again, we understand that that's a picture of a heavenly things. There's a lot of symbolism there. But what I want to focus in on, in on here is the fact that David had good intentions, didn't he? This wasn't a bad thing that David wanted to do. and God puts his stamp of approval on it. But in the process of God you know, approving this, he also reminds David of a few things. And he makes sure that David understands that you know, he is the one that, that exalted him, and it's not the other way around, okay? So we, there's some lessons here in this passage about serving God, lessons about, you know, having right intent, also having right motivations, and staying humble through it, and, and recognizing that we're all ultimately just God's servants, you know, that, that none of us, you know, is, is, should be puffed up one against, uh, one for another, okay? Amen. He says here, uh, he says, uh, verse 3, And Nathan said to the king, Go do all as thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And David, his intentions, again, they're good. And I think, you know, I don't want to act like I'm come across as like I'm picking on David here. You know, David's got good intentions, right? In fact, I appreciate David's vision. You know, he's in his house and he's thinking, he's, his mind is about the things of God and he wants to go big. You know, he wants to do something big for God. He's saying, look, let's build this temple for God to dwell in. Let's get the ark out of this tabernacle, this humble tabernacle, and let's build this uh, you know, the, the, this, this temple for him. And, you know, we go on and we understand that ultimately it was Solomon that built the temple, but God showed David what that temple was going to be. And he showed, you know, he had him prepare all those things. And this wasn't just, you know, this wasn't just some, you know, storefront rental facility. This was like some, uh, some serious building. This was a, a beautiful building, huge building. He went big, you know, he had, and I could appreciate his vision. And look, it's a good thing to have a vision for God, to want to do big things for God. You know, unfortunately, that, that seems like, uh, you know, a big uh, shortcoming in a lot of churches today with a lot of people, even with a lot of Christians. They have a very small vision about what they can accomplish for God. You know, and they think a lot about, you know, well, I'm only so-and-so, you know, and I can only do so much. You know, who am I to, to, to do big things for God? But that's exactly the attitude that David, hit, David had, and he went on and did what? Great things for God, didn't he? Amen. But we see in this passage that he was somebody that had that same view, view of himself, that he, say, he says, you know, who am I? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? He's not like, well, of course I'm going to build the house because I'm David. Don't you, you know, I'm the sweet psalmist of Israel. It's only appropriate that it would be me who builds this house. Now, obviously he was in the position to do that, but he understood that it was God that put him there. Right. And what I'm trying to get across tonight is that, you know, we need to appreciate not, you know, David's vision and the fact that he wanted to do something big for God. The fact that he had a heart to do something for God. You know, we should all have that vision for our lives. Not to just do the bare minimum for God. Not to just kind of put in our time and our two cents just to, you know, get and just do the bare minimum for Lord. We should want to do big things for God. Right. Now, we might not do something at, you know, like this where we're going to build some literal temple for God. But, you know, we could go out and build a lot of smaller temples for God, couldn't we? Because right. now today we are the temple of the living God. Right. You know, we, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in us. We can't, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get so caught up in building, you know, building some facility, you know, buying 10 acres somewhere, having a massive parking lot, make sure it's striped nice and have all the, you know, you know, deck the place out with a bunch of fancy furnishings. You know, we're not concerned about that, that kind of a temple. We're concerned about going out and making a lot of little temples, aren't we? Yeah. Getting people saved, you know, getting people uh, to know the Lord, getting them filled with the Holy Spirit. 
you know, and building God's house that way, you know, filling our Father's house through our efforts soul winning. Amen. You know, and I'm never going to say, well, you, boy, you bring that up a lot. You seem to bring up soul winning a lot. Yeah, that's why we do so much of it. That's, right. that's why this happens to me, a soul winning church. You know, the day the preacher starts to back down on that and not emphasize it and not remind us that it's what we're here to do, to go out and knock doors and to see souls saved and to preach the gospel, you know, that's the day that we start to scale back our soul winning. And there's too much of that going on today. There's too many Baptist churches that are just putting soul winning, you know, on the back burner or not even doing it at all. Just saying, well, that doesn't work anymore. Well, you know, I, I beg to differ. You know, we, we know that it works. You know, and that's just one area that we could think about doing something big for God. You know, starting a church somewhere, doing a big work for God, you know, reaching lots of people uh, in, 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 in that way, right? But, you know, maybe you're somebody who can't do that. You know, it doesn't have the ability... You know, because here's the thing, not everyone has as much free time as everybody else. You know, not, not all of the, you know, the, you know, a lot of mothers and, and fathers in here, you know, they're not in the same position as, you know, say, uh, like a single person, right? Somebody who's single has a lot more time to go out and do that kind of work, don't they? Right. They don't have a lot of the responsibilities and the demands. And that's not to say, you know, what, that, that, that's better or worse for either party involved. That's just the way life is. That's just the way it goes. You know, so... You know, if you are in that boat of somebody who maybe doesn't have the family, doesn't have, isn't tied down with other responsibilities, you know, take advantage of that opportunity. Go on the missions trip. You know, go on the soul winning marathon. Do the extra soul winning. Do you know, do those things because that is a season that goes away usually in life. That's, right. and that's not to say that you know those of us that are married, those of us that have kids, still can't do great things for God. You know, we can and we are and we will. It might not be as in the, in the immediate future, you know, but what if we raise, you know, five or six soul winners? What if we raise a family of soul winners who are going to do not only the soul winning I could have done if I were single, but much more than that as well? Amen. So you can see how both parties involved, you know, they can still both do great things for God. You know, no matter who, and I'm just using as an example to get this point across, no matter who you are, you could do something for God if you wanted to. God could use you in a great way. No matter where you are in life, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter, you know, what, what your past is, God can still use you to do great things for God. Amen. I mean, that's what, Dave, that's what I see here with David. That's his heart, you know, and I appreciate his vision of him sitting in his own house and not just getting comfortable, like, well, the ark's good enough where it is. It's got the tabernacle after all, and God wanted to do anything about it, he could. You know, I'm just going to focus on my own thing and do my own thing. No, he said, what can we do more for the Lord? What more can we do for God? Let me build him in house. And the fact that it wasn't God's idea, it was David's idea, you know, it just goes to show you the type of heart that David had for God, that he was somebody that wanted to do something big for God. But on that same token, you know, that's great. It's great to want to do things for God. But we want to get it, and I'm not saying David had this attitude, but we want to make sure that we don't develop this attitude in our service to God. That, you know, well, I'm going to do something great for God, and God can, you know, show me how much he appreciates it. Let me, we don't want to mistake us doing something great for God as us doing God a favor, okay? Because that's what's going on in this passage when I read it. That's what I kind of see. David, you know, I'm not saying this was his attitude, but I think God kind of takes the time to just check him a little bit and say, well, let's just make sure that you, you don't develop this attitude, okay? Of, of him, and he reminds him that, look, God doesn't need any favors, Okay. It goes on there in verse 4, and it says, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the day that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? saying, oh, you're going to build me a house? He's like, I don't remember asking for one. I don't remember me telling anybody to build me a house, David. You know, and he's, he's showing him that, look, I'm perfectly content to just have my ark right where it is. Because you have to remember who we're talking about. You're talking about God, right? Even that temple he didn't care about eventually. Even that temple he destroyed more than once. He had people just come in and lay it to the ground, right? That, you know, he let that take place. He said, go ahead and build the temple because what? All these things or a shadow of things to come. You know, God's throne is in heaven. You know, there's a tabernacle in heaven, and there's no edifice on earth that is going to compare to the glory which is in heaven, Amen. where God is. So he's not really impressed with anything that we're going to do down here. I mean, what building are we going to make and, and show off to God? 
you know, go to, take me to the biggest city with the biggest skyscrapers and the most, you know, fanciest museums and whatever. Show me the most beautiful, take me to the Taj Mahal, you know, the, the, just the, the biggest, most luxurious buildings that man has made. And it's, it's, it's a shack compared to anything that God has made. Amen. It's a doghouse. It's not even, God's not even worthy of God to use as a footstool. I mean, so God here, he's kind of reminding him, look, I'm not really impressed with anything that you're going to do. I really don't require any of that. I mean, what are you going to do? How are you going to make a temple for me to dwell in? I'm the God of heaven, right? right? And what he's doing is just reminding him, look, he doesn't say, David, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to want to build a temple for me? He's not cutting him down, right? He's not telling him he was wrong to do that. We already know that even Nathan, the prophet said, do all that is in the heart. The Lord is with thee. You know, and he, and he gives David the stamp of approval. What he's doing, though, is making sure that David understands that when we serve God, even when we do something great, when we do something big, we're not doing God any favors. Right. You know, we have a vision here to knock all these doors in Tucson. Yeah. You know, we have a vision to reach the greater Arizona. We, as, you know, part of Faith Forward Baptist Church, the goal is to knock every door in the state. And that's getting done, by the way. That's not just some pie-in-the-sky dream. You know, that's something that is happening. You know, we are doing that. We are accomplishing that goal. And that's a big deal, you know, and even Pastor Anderson himself said he doesn't, he's never heard of any other church having done something like that. You know, there very well may have been, you know, back in Paul's day, maybe they knocked every door in every region that would be equivalent to the size of, you know, our state or something like that. It probably has happened, but you haven't heard about it recently, have you? That's a pretty big work, isn't it? That's a big vision to say, hey, I'm going to knock every door in this state to set an example for other churches that they can do likewise, you know, and, but why are we doing that? Why do we have a big vision? Just because we want to try to impress one another, because we want to impress other people, or because we feel like, you know, uh, we want to impress God with what we're doing? No, we're doing that because, you know, that is our reasonable service. That is just what God wants done. Right. If we're going to do something for God, let's do as much as we can for God. You know, that's the vision that we have, but we want to make sure that we don't get this attitude of, well, I'm, we're going to knock every door in Tucson, and, and hopefully the Lord appreciates what we're doing. That's a very arrogant and prideful attitude to have, you know, and, and, but that can creep in. Maybe even not on, when we're talking, even on, a, even on a smaller scale of a vision, people might say, well, you know, I'm going to go soul winning an hour every week, and I hope the Lord appreciates that. Yeah. You know, I'm reading my Bible every day. You know, I, I hope that, that God notices, and he makes sure that, you know, he's, he's uh, racking this up to my account. And, you know, when, I, when it's time for me, I need a little something for God. He better you know, recognize the fact that I'm, you know, living the Christian life. Like, oh, well, just, yeah, absolutely. You've been reading your Bible? Man, you've been soul winning? Wow, you know, you're really something, right? Wrong. <laughs> no, right? And no matter how big of a vision to get, no matter how much work we do, no matter how much we accomplish for God, we should never get this attitude of, I'm really somebody for the things that I've done for God. Because that's, you know, that's what I see here with, that God is doing with David. He's saying, look, you could go ahead and build this temple, but just remember, I didn't ask you to do it. And you're not doing me any favors. And in fact, later we know that he just goes ahead. He, we, we know what God really thinks about that temple, how much, he, how, how much he really esteems it when he just has it wrecked. Okay. Because here's the thing, you know, you, you say doing a great work for God is, is, and having a big vision, that's great. You know, I, I want to inspire that. I want people to, to share in that vision. That's the vision I have for myself. That's the vision I have for this church. That's what we should aspire to do, right? We should we aspire to serve God and, and live the Christian life and all of that. But we have to understand this, that serving God, you know, is our privilege. It's our, our, it's our privilege. Not only that, it's our duty. If you would, go over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. When you get to 1 Peter, bookmark it. We're going to come back at the end. But 1 Peter chapter 1. You know, serving God is your, not only your privilege, it's also your duty. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. How are you, should you pass your time here? You should do it in fear. Doing what? You know, serving God, because he's going to judge you what? According to your work. You know, that, that's what is worse, just supposed to do. You say, well, I fear God, I serve God, I live for the Lord. Great, that's what you're supposed to do. Because serving God and fearing the Lord, you know, that's not just your privilege, that is your duty to do, right? And we shouldn't just expect, well, you know, I, you know, God should acknowledge me or I should get some, you know, I should get a gold star 
or a, a, you know some kind of spiritual cookie, you know that doesn't make you the teacher's pet just because you've passed your time of your sojourning here in fear. That's your reasonable service. Go over to uh, go over to First Corinthians chapter four. First Corinthians chapter four. We know that passage in Romans twelve. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's a very, you know, probably people in this room have that memorized. It's a very famous passage, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says it's your reasonable service to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You know, that's like, that's like bare minimum. And we don't want to develop this attitude, well, I'm living a holy life. I presented my body a living sacrifice unto God. You know, therefore, you know, I'm, I'm extra special and I deserve, ex, you know, I've done extra credit. No, you've done the minimum. You've done what's your reasonable service. You know, and, and the, you know, the other way you could preach that is to say, hey, if you're struggling to do that, then go, well, that's a big ask. You know, that's a lot for God to ask for me to live holy and to present my body. That's a big ask. No, the Bible says it's reasonable. Amen. And why is it reasonable? Because, you know, we didn't read it there in First Peter 4, but because it says, you know, you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. You know, you weren't redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know, that's a pretty reasonable exchange. You know, Christ comes and lays down his life for us, dies, buried, you know, rose again. It's a pretty, it's a reasonable, a pretty reasonable uh, ask for him to say, okay, now I need you to live for me. Not be perfect, you know, because that's impossible. But I need you to present your body a living sacrifice. I need you to do the things that I ask you to do. I need you to serve me with your life. Well, that's a lot to ask for my life. Well, that's exactly what Jesus gave for us, isn't it? So it's not, it's not a big ask. So if we, you know, if we accomplish this, if we do do this, if we find ourselves sojourning in fear, working for the Lord, serving God, even trying to do something big for God, we should never get this attitude of, well, I'm doing God a favor. No, we're doing what is our privilege and what is our duty to do as Christians. Amen. <clears throat> you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 6. And it says in verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Who, for who maketh thee to differ from, one, one, uh, from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So what's he saying? He's saying, look, he doesn't want you to think above men that which is written. You know, we shouldn't think that about ourselves. We shouldn't get this idea like, well, I'm really somebody. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm real special because I serve God and I do something. It's like, look, you've just done your reasonable service. We shouldn't think about that ourselves. We shouldn't feel that way about other people either. You know, we shouldn't puff up other people in our own minds and make them out to be more than what they are. Now, look, we should respect people that are worthy of respect, obviously. You know, and that's everybody. <laughs> we should all love God's children. We should all get along and all of that. But we should not lift up one person above another and say, well, this, this is the pinnacle of, you know, this is the, you know, what's a good example? Well, you can think about preaching, you know. This is something, you know, let me just, you know, come clean a little bit here. I have to, you know, keep myself in check when it comes to this, when it comes to preaching. You know, I found myself listening to other preachers and being, man, if I could just preach like that guy. Oh, I wish I could preach a sermon like that. I wish I could just rip face like that. I wish I could have people saying that. Oh, what a great sermon. You know, and what am I doing when I do that? I'm, I'm being puffed up for one against another. And, and I'm, you know, it's an unreasonable standard, really, to think, to think, oh, I'm trying to be like somebody else. You know, that's, that's the wrong way to go about it, right? And, you know, I'm just, that's just a personal illustration. You, you could use that in any way in your own life. You could apply that in your own life. You know, maybe when it comes to soul winning thinking, oh, this so-and-so is the ultimate soul winner. I got to be just like them. No, you don't. You need to be you. Right. You know, another housewife might look at another housewife and say, oh, she's so good with the kids. She's so good at, you know, all these duties. She's so good at the cooking and the educating. She's so smart. She's got everything together. But what you're doing is you're puffing them up. You're, you're lifting them up one above another. Because what does that say about the rest of the housewives? Yeah, but she's great, but, you know, these other ones... <laughs> Oh, he's a great soul winner, but he stinks. Oh, he's a great preacher, but this guy, pff, whatever. I'll catch it if I can. You know, maybe I'll listen. I don't know. But that's what he's saying here. It's like, look, don't puff up. You know, don't get puffed up one for and against another. Don't what think of, of men above that which is written. And what's written about men? 
that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that no one's perfect, that everyone has a heart that is deceitful and wicked, <laughs> and, you know, desperately wicked above all things. That's in every single one of us. So we don't want to get into this thing of comparing ourselves among ourselves. The Bible says those that compare, them that are you know, comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Right. You shouldn't do that in any area. Okay. <clears throat> Go over to uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Look, whatever capacity you're going to serve God in, that's the capacity you need to serve God in. And not worry about what somebody else is doing or how they do it. We should just serve God the best way we know how. <clears throat> and God will use us. But we don't want to get this attitude of, well, I'm doing God a favor. Uh, well, you know, I've served God. I'm doing something big, so, you know, he needs to come through for me. No, he doesn't. He will. You know, if we are faithful, God will come through for us. We have that promise. <clears throat> Look at Luke 17, verse 7. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat. It will not rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. He's saying, look, if you had a servant, you had somebody who was, you know, you employed to do your manual labor out in the field and to cook your meals, you know, when that guy got done from a long day's work and he came home, and he came back to the house, you would say, feed me now. Because why? Because that's his job. That's what I paid him, that guy, to do, right? That's what he's saying here. Look, if, if, if you have a, this servant, are you going to tell him, oh, go get something to eat, then worry about me? No, you're going to say, serve me, right? He's saying, you know, you're going to serve me, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Verse 9, doth, that, uh, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? So this servant, you know, goes out, he gets hired, he goes out and he works in the field, he puts in a long day's work, then he comes back, and the master says, now, now go make me something to eat and serve me, and then you can eat. And when he does all that, is he supposed to, would you expect that guy to say, oh, thank you so much for doing everything that I commanded you to do? And, and this, is a, you know, this is a very uh, important uh, illustration that, that Jesus is trying to get us to understand here. He's saying, uh, verse 10, I trow not. You know, trow is like, I think not. You know, he's saying, nope, <laughs> right? That's not what you would expect. At least you shouldn't. That when that guy goes and does the things which are what commanded him. You know, it's one thing to ask somebody to do you a favor, right? Say, hey, can you help me out with this? You know, if you're not saying thank you, if you're not grateful, you know, you're a jerk at that point, okay? But when it's a servant, when it's somebody, this is what it's expected of them. It'd be like if you went to work and put in a hard day's work and earned it, you know, you go to your job where they're paying you to be there, paying you to be there, paying you to accomplish certain tasks, and then you got, you know, then the payday comes, you know, and they give you your paycheck, and you're like, well, where's my thank you? Well, we just paid you to do all those things, right? That was the agreement. Your time, we give you money. I know, but I would appreciate a thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get a thank you. You might not even have a job to come back to. I don't know. It depends on your employer, right? You'd get laughed out of the room. What do you mean, thank you? If anything, you should be thanking me for giving you a job, right? right? That people get that mixed up today, don't they? They think that people are in business to just, uh, you know, because they just want to give away money, you know. <laughs> They're there to put people to work, right? We should be grateful that there's people that want to take on all that risk and everything. That's a whole other sermon. But that's kind of what he's saying here, right? He's saying, look, if you have a guy that's working for you and you put him to work, you're not going to thank him for doing what you commanded him to do. That would be, it would be foolish. So what's the application? Well, verse 10, so likewise, likewise ye... When you have done all those things which were commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. You know, this is the attitude that we have to have when it comes to serving God. We go out, we do the soul winning, we raise the family, you know, we, we go to church, we read our, our Bibles, we pray. You know, the Christian life isn't that complicated. You know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a lot of things that we have to do. It's just very important things that we have to do. We have to do them consistently, Right. And when we do them, when we accomplish those things, we shouldn't just get it in our heads like, well, I'm really somebody now. I'm something special. No, he's saying, you know what? You're unprofitable. All you've met is the bare minimum. You've gotten, you were in debt, right? Christ died for you. He's the one that bought your life with his precious blood. You're indebted, right? And now you're starting to do those things which are commanded. It's like, okay, now you've broken even. You, you, and probably not even that. <laughs> he's saying you're unprofitable servants. You're not even profitable to me. 
At best, you've broken, you've gotten to zero. You're not even out of the red, even when you've served God. Yeah, but I've done all this soul winning. I've raised a family. I preached all these sermons. I started a church. I reached a whole community. I did, you know, I, we sent out preachers. I did this work. I did that work. I did all these things for you. Yeah, you met, and you're still unprofitable. Because when we serve God, we can't have this attitude that we're doing him a favor. We're doing what? Our reasonable service. We're doing that which is what? Our duty to do. It's your job to do those things. And people get this attitude sometimes of, you know, they, they serve God in even in the smallest of ways. Even the smallest of ways. And they start to think that they did some, something great for God. I went to church. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Aren't you something, right? You came to church. You know, coming to church consistently, you know, there's something to be said about that. But even then, that's just like bare minimum. I came to church. I came to an air-conditioned room. I sat down in a padded seat, and I stared up at the front of the room and pretended I was listening. Oh, man, that, man, stand aside, Apostle Paul. Look out, 12 disciples. I mean, we got a, we got a real winner here, right? But people get, you know, look, I'm making a joke at it, but that's out there. And they, sometimes they'll even come to the preacher and be like, just want to let you know I'm here. You know, they're like, well, I made it this Sunday. Aren't you impressed? It's like, nope, I'm not. Not impressed. <clears throat> we don't want to get that attitude creep in, in on us where we're thinking that we're really something because we've done only that which is our duty to do. Amen. Only that which is God has asked us. So, you know, that's kind of what God's doing here. If you want to go back, keep something in 1 Peter 1 if you did, and then go back to 2 Samuel 7. That's what I think God's kind of doing here with David. You know, David has this big vision. He's got a good intentions. His heart's right. He wants to do something big for God. And God's just kind of taking the time to check him and make sure, like, hey, that's fine. You want to do this for me? But just remember, I didn't ask you to do that. You're not doing me any favors, David. I'm perfectly happy with the way things are. But go ahead and do it. He said in verse 8, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto David, my servant, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat. So God, you know, he's reminding David in this passage that who exalted who? right? Because David wants to build this tabernacle to the glory of God, which is a good thing, right? He's exalting the name of the Lord. That's his intent. That's a good thing. But God's taking the time just to, remember, just to remind him, like, let's not forget who exalted who in this relationship. Let's not forget that it was me that took you from the sheep coat, that you were just some shepherd boy that your dad just wanted to forget when Samuel came around. Remember when Samuel came around and brought his, his brothers before him to anoint the next king of Israel? And, and God said, it's not this one, it's not this one, it's not this one. And he says, have you had any other children? The youngest, but he keeps the sheep. That was their opinion of him. Yeah, he's the, he keeps the sheep. What do you, surely it's not him. And that's who it turned out to be. That's who God exalted. The one that he, what, that's what he points out. I took thee from what? From the sheep coat. You know, you were just some shepherd boy out in the sticks, out in the cold, out in the wet, out in the heat, out in the night, just wandering around following sheep. Hard work, but it's not exactly, you know, the most, mental work there is it's not exactly the most you know intellectual work to keep sheep you know make sure nothing eats them make sure they have plenty to eat you know catch them you know, when they have young or whatever it's you know, i'm sure there's stuff involved but it's not exactly rocket science here and he's saying i took me and he's reminding them that it's god that exalted him and that's the that's what we need to be reminded of at all times no matter what we accomplish for the lord you know how much how much god uses us we have to remember that it's God that used us, that God exalted us, that God redeemed us. And anything that we accomplish for God is only because of his grace and his mercy. Right. He said, I took thee from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. And I was with, with thee whithersoever thou wentest and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the, are in the earth. So in David's case, this was a very high exaltation, wasn't it? He went from being a nobody, you know, the youngest in his family, a keeper of sheep, to being those that have, like, unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. I mean, all the men at that time knew who King David was. So what do we learn from this is that, you know, God is taking the time to, to remind David that it was God who exalted him. You know, David wants to glorify God. He's kind of making sure that he understands the order of things here. But what we, can, uh, what we can get out of this is that the fact that God exalts people. You say, well, I want to be exalted. I want God to use me in a great way. You know, I want God to exalt me. God exalts people who are content not being exalted. Amen. You know, that's the paradox. 
You know, that's the irony. You know, if you would, if you kept something in 1 Peter, you know, we're going to come back again later, but go back to chapter 5. We all know this passage. We all know this verse. You probably just quote it. We would all know it, right? But God exalts people who are content not being exalted. It's not like David, you know, when he was anointed, came running in at the last minute and said, oh, Samuel here? I heard Samuel's here. I'm here to get anointed because obviously it's me, right? No, he had no idea. Someone had to come find him and anoint him. And then we, you know, we've already gone through 1 Samuel. We know how that played out. Even when he's already been anointed and it's obvious that he's the next king, that God has told him, you're going to be the next king, he still doesn't just take the throne. He waits for it to come to him, right? He waits for that exaltation to come to him. He doesn't try to push it, okay? That's, what, that's how God works. God exalts people who are content not being exalted. You know, David would have spent the rest of his life just out keeping the sheep, writing his psalms, singing to the Lord on a, you know, his stringed instrument or whatever, and just, that would have been it. That would have been his life. But God saw something else and said, you know, I can use this guy. Why? I can exalt this guy. Why? Because he's not in it to just have the glory, right? He's not just in it because he wants to be a big shot or be somebody. That's who God is going to exalt. That's why we need to what, learn to humble, our, humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that he sh and he shall lift you up. That's what it says in James. It says it again in 1 Peter verse 5, or, or 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, look, if we accomplish anything for God, is it going to be because of our mighty hand? Look, our hands aren't that mighty. In fact, they're pretty feeble. In fact, they're pretty weak. You know, I didn't come up with the gospel. That wasn't my idea. I can't take credit for that. The Lord did that. You know, I'm not the one who did everything that Jesus did. He did all that. All I'm doing is just opening my mouth and, and talking. And you know what? That, and, and I'm not, I might not even be that eloquent when I do it. You know, when I go out and I start preaching it's, you know, the gospel to somebody, you know, it might not even come across. It might be a little shaky. It might be a little choppy. It might not even be that good. I might not be the smoothest talker. I might not be... You know, I might not even be a people person. I might be some introvert. Look, there's people like this. They go out and go soul winning, but it's the word of God that has power. Amen. And they take the Bible and they let God, it's God's mighty hand that gets the work done. And God, we have the privilege and the duty to just, you know, let God exalt us in due time and use us in that way. <clears throat> God exalts people who are content not being exalted. That's why we need to humble ourselves that he will exalt you in due time. And, you know, David, he, he reacts properly to this. You want to go back there. You can see that David had a good heart, that he was a good man, that he was a humble person, because he doesn't just go, well, pfft, oh, God, you know, I know all that. I know you took me from the sheep coat, but let's not forget everything I did. Let's not forget how I wandered around the wilderness for years running from David or from Saul. Let's not forget that I've united the, the, you know, all the tribes of Israel under one banner. Let's not forget that, you know, you did pick me and I'm really something. That's not his reaction, right? God kind of comes, shows up and reminds him of his, what, like I preached a couple weeks ago, his humble beginnings, right? That he came from a sheep coat, that he was a nobody that, that, was, that got exalted. And David reacts and he proves what I'm saying tonight, that people who do not want to be exalted are the ones usually that get exalted. He, he reacts by proving he was worthy he, his reaction proves that he was worthy of being exalted. Look at verse 17. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? You know, David starts out wanting to do this great work for God, build this temple. And God says, You know what? It wasn't my idea, but I like where your heart's at. But let's not forget who exalted who. Let's not forget that it was me that got you to where you are. And David's reaction is what? To go in and sit before the Lord of God. And, and he says, you know what? You're basically saying, you're right. You're right, God. Who am I? David's being reminded of his, what? His humble beginning, his, his, his past in all this. Being reminded that it was God that exalted him. And this just shows us that David has what? Genuine humility. Genuine humility. You know, humility is something that we have to have in the Christian life. We have to have it in life, period, but especially in the Christian life. Humility is essential. I mean, he just got done telling us, humble yourselves. What is he saying? Be a humble person. Have humility. You know, we should be humble people. And people, you know, it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of this, it's kind of ironic because sometimes people are so proud of how humble they are. Right? <laughs> you ever notice that? Like, I'm, 
I'm sure am proud. I'm, you know what? I'm more humble than that guy. <laughs> I mean, I can just look at that guy and I could just, you know, I know this about him. I know that about them. You know, they do this and they do that and they say this. I mean, and I wouldn't do or say any of those things because I'm just so much more humble. Is that really humility? No, that's, that's not genuine humility. And you can't fake real humility, can you? You can't fake it. That's why real humil- humility often comes when, when, when we've, what, been cut down. When we've, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been puffed up and then something happens, you know, somebody says something, we get cut down, we get taken down a few notches, and then we learn what it means to be really be humble because we've been humbled, right? That's kind of what's happening in the story. Not that David was reacting proudly, but, you know, he's been exalted, right? He's the king of Israel. He's about to do a great work for God. And God says, look, I took you from a sheep coat. You were nobody. And he goes, you know what? Who am I? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? And you can kind of see some things about genuine humility. And I'll wrap it up by just kind of making some, some, you know, some observations about David's humility here. The first thing is, you know, it says there that he went in, uh, then da- verse 18, then went King David in and did what? Sat before the Lord. You know, genuine humility is something that's done in private. It's something that's done in private. If you're a humble person, you know, he, he's sitting down before the Lord. He didn't, it didn't say he gathered all Israel together and made this speech and we wanted to make sure, you know, hey, Nathan, come with me. I want, I want to make sure you hear my response to God. He went and sat before the Lord and said this. He said, who am I and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? You know, that was something between him and God. That's not something that he had to like broadcast to everybody. Look how humble I am. I'm agreeing with God that I'm a nobody. Just want everyone to know that I, I, I abase myself, that I just want everyone in this room to know that I, I, I understand that I'm a no one. I'm a nobody, okay? You know, I, I come from very humble beginnings and, and, and I understand I've gotten to this high position only because of how humble I am right? Is that, is that what David's at? No, this is something he's doing in private. That's what genuine humility does. It doesn't care if anybody else notices whether or not they're humble. <laughs> yeah, that's genuine humility. He does this in private before the Lord. You know, and this is something that people can fall into, this, this, this fake humility, you know, and it's religious people that, you know, that, that, that uh, Jesus pointed out. We won't turn there for sake of time, but in Mark 12, we know the passage where he said, and he said unto them in his doc, said unto them in his, in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes and Pharisees, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace. They love to do this before men. What they go in the long clothing, they're drawing attention to themselves. Look, I am a religious figure. Look, I am a spiritual person. They're drawing attention to themselves, and and brought and wanting to broadcast people that they are what religious, right? They're they're holy people. Okay. That's not what we want to be like. We don't want to go around making sure everybody knows how holy we are, or that we're religious. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't. Have, people ask, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord. Are you saved? I go to church, all that. But this idea of going around and just making sure everybody understands how humble I am and how holy I am, you know, and just, and people do this, you know, and, I, and, and I'm not, I don't want to like try to give out, you know, specific examples, but look, we can all fall prey to this. This idea of, of, well, I'm so humble, and it's important that everybody knows this, right? That's what happens. It, it, genuine humility is done in private. They love the salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost uh, rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, right? The long prayers. This, you know, long prayers is great when it's done with God, when there's nobody else around to hear it but you and God. Long prayers are great. Hey, pray long. What, can you not watch with me even for one hour, Jesus said? You know, that's, that's a long prayer. You know, one hour is a long time to pray. You know, but am I going to stand up and pray in front of everybody for an hour? Or a minute? Or, you know, how long is too long? I don't know. But, you know, when people are kind of starting to do this, you know, when you're praying, is he done yet? Is he wrapping up? Or if you're doing that, you're praying and you're looking around like, is this going across good? You know, is everyone liking this? Is there anyone crying? You know, that's, you know, that's not before God, you know. And look, I get, I get public prayer, you know, we pray here. But, you know, those are usually pretty short prayers, aren't they? Bless the service, bless the preaching of God's word. Thank you for this, this time together. Amen. Right? That's a quick prayer. This isn't, you know, that's not what I would call, you know, a, making for pretense a long prayer. Okay? But that's what these guys did. 
They wanted to show everybody how holy and how humble they were before God. Look how long I pray to the Lord. I'm so holy. I'm so humble. I've got nothing better to do with my time to just talk to God in front of everybody else. You know, David's humility was genuine because he did it in private with God. And then notice what he says there. He says, his prayer is this. He sat before the Lord and he said, who am I? Who am I? You know, genuine humility, they see their own unworthiness. They see their own inadequacy. And this is kind of a catch-22 sometimes with people. You know, people will say, oh, I can't serve God. I'm a nobody. You know, I'm too inadequate. I have too many faults. You know, I, I have too many flaws. You know, I have poor character. Or, you know, I wasn't raised in a Christian home or, you know, or whatever. People come up with all these, they get these ideas in their head why they can't serve God. You know, and, it, and, and it's not even that they're just trying to make an excuse. They genuinely feel this way about themselves sometimes. I know this about people, that they genuinely sell themselves short. But you know what the irony is, is that it's exactly who God will use. The person who thinks that they can't do anything. That's the irony. The guy that's like, well, of course I could do anything God asks of me. Yeah, the Christian life, pff, I got that in the bag. That's the guy that's going to gonna trip and fall. That's because, you know, that's, that's a haughty spirit, which goes before destruction. He will use the guy that actually feels that way about himself. That's what David said. Who am I? Who am I? What is my house? Who are we? We're nobody. He's, you know, he's seeing his own, what, unworthiness to serve God. Well, of course, I'm going to serve God. I'm worthy. Of course, he's gonna, I'm going to the one to do it because who else would be as good enough, going to do as good a job as me, right? Wrong. That's the wrong attitude to have. That's not genuine humility. David had genuine humility because he said, who am I? He saw his own inadequacy. And, you know, I think the Apostle Paul is another great example of this. And there's several passages we could look at. But go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Timothy 1, Paul said this. You know, we could see Paul's own, you know, Paul is somebody who did great things for God. Like, my opinion is he's the greatest Christian that ever lived. I mean, he's done more. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to measure up. And that's not, you know, Paul would probably disagree. You know, Paul would probably say, no, no. You know, he's genuinely too humble probably to even take that, that compliment. But that's the truth, I believe. I mean, show me somebody else who's accomplished the things that the Apostle Paul did. But why was he able to do that? Because he was the Apostle Paul? Because he was some great Pharisee? Because he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews? No, it was because he knew that he was inadequate. Because that he was insufficient. Because he was not worthy to do those things. That's who God ended up using. He said, I thank God, uh, Christ Jesus, our Lord, I'm reading from 1 Timothy, who hath enabled me for that he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He said, look, he's given glory to God. It was God that enabled me. It wasn't my pedigree. Who was before blasphemed or persecuted and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. He says in verse 15, we know this verse, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He's saying, look, I'm the worst sinner there is. I was a blasphemer, I was injurious, I persecuted the church. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy. For what cause did he obtain mercy? This is important. And people need to hear this. People need to be reminded of this. Because people get it in their heads all the time. I can't serve God. I, you know, I have this past. Or I did this. Or I, you know, I, I did something. Or I, whatever reason. People make all these, they, they, they have these, they sell themselves short. And say, well, I can't serve God. I'm inadequate. I'm unworthy. That's exactly who God's going to use. Because we see at the end of the story, it's God ultimately is the one that gets the glory. God uses people that are inadequate. God uses people that are unworthy. That way he gets the glory. Because no flesh is going to glory in his presence. He, that's what he's saying here in 1 Timothy. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe unto him unto life everlasting. He's saying, God used me, who was a blasphemer, blasphemer persecutor, and jurist. He used me to show the, uh, to, as an example to those that will come after that God uses people who are inadequate. God even uses wicked people who have a wicked past. God will still use that person mightily if, they're, if they are genuinely humble people. And the person who's saying, look, I can't do it. I can't serve God. That's the person God's going to use. That's the case with Paul. I mean, that's what he said there. This cause I obtain mercy to be a pattern to them which should hereafter believe unto him unto life everlasting. That's why he's saying, look, the only reason God used me is as a case study in the fact that God uses people who are not worthy of being used. Right. 
because nobody's worthy of being used. That's the thing. At the end of the day, I don't care how squeaky clean your, your past is or how spiritual you are. At the end of the day, nobody is worthy of being used in God. He said, Paul said unto me, who am less than least of all the saints. I'm up here saying he's the greatest Christian who ever lived. Paul is saying, I'm the least of all saints. I'm less than least of all saints that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 14. Now, thanks be to God. See, because that's the end result right there, isn't it? When God uses people who are genuinely humble, who are in it for the right reasons, that's, this is what happens. God gets the glory. God gets the thanks. Now, thanks be unto God, who which causeth us always to triumph in Christ, who made manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? That God's using us. We're, we're triumphing. We're making manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. We are a sweet, uh, we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ and them that are saved and them that perish. To the one we are the Savior of death and to the other the Savior of life. What he's talking about here, he's talking about the fact that he's going around preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ, that God is using him to triumph in Christ, that God is using him to be a sweet Savior of life and death. God is using Paul in a mighty way, a great way. We have a guy who has this wicked past. And he says there, to the one we are savior of life, uh, of death unto death, and to the other of savior of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things? What is sufficient? It means adequate. Who's adequate for this? Who's meat for this? Who can live up to this? Who's sufficient for these things? You know, that's kind of a hypothetical question. And he goes on and he answers in, in chapter three. We'll look at it in a second. But here's the answer. Nobody. Nobody is sufficient. Nobody's adequate. Well, of course, I'm the one that's going to go around and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ because of who I am, because of my pedigree, because of my whatever. No, that's, you're the person God's not going to use if that's your attitude. <clears throat> and he's saying, who is sufficient for these things? Look at chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Paul's saying, look, I'm being used in this great way by God, but you know what? I'm the least of all apostles. I'm the chiefest of all sinners. It's no coincidence that that's the guy that got used the greatest, the guy who thought the least of himself. And he said, who is sufficient? Excuse me, verse 5, chapter 3. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Look, if we accomplish anything in this life for Christ, it's only by his power. He, it's because he's the one that has made us sufficient. He's the one that has made us adequate. He is the one that has counted us faithful and put us into the ministry and used us, not because of who we are, but because of his mercy, because of his grace. That's what David was getting across here. You know, that's what David was, was expressing. God was, you know, making, reminding him of this in this passage. He wanted to do this great work for God, and God's saying, well, just, just, let's not forget, shepherd boy. <laughs> I know you're a king now, but remember what you were when I found you. And I'm the one that got you to where you are, and it was my hand that let, exalted you in due time. And that's what, and David at the end, he's not, you know, like, well, pff, getting all puffed up. And, well, who do you, you know, I mean, I'm, I know that's what I was, but I'm, I've really made myself into something. And he's saying, you know what, who am I? Just like Paul, like Paul here. People would look at Paul and say, the greatest Christian that's ever lived. You know what, chiefest of all sinners. That's what Paul would say. And he goes on in 2 Samuel, if you want to turn back there, in verse 19. And he says, and this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and this is the manner of, uh, and is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord, knowest thy servant. He says, "Look, this was a small thing in thy sight. What was the small thing that God took him out of the sheep coat and exalted him to be the king, and gave him a great name like all the great men of the earth?" He said, "God, that was easy for you. You know that'd be hard for me and you to do." It'd be hard, you know, if we wanted to go be some big shot out in the world, you know, like, well, I'm going to be a state, you know, what the world considers a big shot. You know, we could, we could talk about what, what I think about that position later. But, you know, the world would say, oh, you're a senator? Oh, you're, you know, you're a, you know, you're a state representative? You're a real big shot. Oh, you're the mayor. Oh, you're in the city council? Oh, you made some big position? You're a real big shot, right? If, if we wanted to do that, that would take effort, wouldn't it? We'd have to go campaign, raise funds. It would take a lot of work for us to get a position like that. You know, especially, you know, me at this point. <laughs> I'd have to, like, purge YouTube somehow. <laughs> it would never happen. It'd be impossible. They'd say, wait a minute, did you preach this sermon? Is this the same guy? Yeah, I'm sorry, you're not going to cut it in the Tucson City Council. Right? But if people want to get to some high office in the land, they put a lot of work into that, don't they? Yeah. 
they're campaigning. And then as soon as they're in their office, you know what? You know, they're just thinking about the next campaign and everything they're doing so they can get elected again, right? And all, and all I'm saying is this, is that God, David went from shepherd boy to, you know, the king of Israel who's just like defeating everybody. I mean, it started out in this passage that he had rest from all his enemies. Does that just mean everybody turned around and went home? No, we read about how he smote the Philistines twice. I mean, he's just wrecking everybody. He's powerful. He's mighty. He's got mighty men. He's, he's a man of war, right? He, he, he went the hard way, but he says, look, God did that for me. And he says, this was a small thing in thy sight. And what David is showing us is that he understands is that he is somebody who can be replaced. And I'm, I'm saying this carefully because I don't want to give this idea that, you know, we're not, none of us is important because we are. Look, we're ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's a very high calling. I challenge you to find a more important job in this world than that of soul winner. I challenge you to do that. What's, think, so what's the most important thing I could do with my life? Well, how could I most serve people? It's through soul winning, friend. Amen. It's through, I mean, that's what the Bible says. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. I mean, show me another job. Show me another position where you can say that's like, oh, God is using me to beseech other people to be what? Reconciled to God. That's the biggest change you could ever make in somebody's life, having them be reconciled to God. And God does that through us. You know, that's a very important position. So I don't want to, you know, give this idea that, oh, we're, we're not important. We are. But we also have to remember that we are replaceable. That's what David's saying. Look, you took me from shepherd boy to the king of Israel, and this was a small thing in thy sight. You think it was hard for God to do that? Nope, it was easy for God to do. I mean, he could go find another person and, and work, you know, work things in their life and bring them around. And I'm not saying God just, you know, turns people into little marionettes and just controls them all the way. But look, God can, can find somebody else to do our jobs. Somebody else can step in and fill our positions. You know, what we're doing, what I'm getting at is this, what we're doing, anybody could do if they had genuine humility, that God would use that person just as much as anybody else. <clears throat> he says there in verse 21, for thy word's sake and according to thine heart hast thou done all these great things. Not to what? Exalt me so that people could look at how great I am. He said, for thy word's sake, thou hast done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Verse 26, and let thy name be magnified forever. The Lord of hosts is God, is, is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. You know, when a person has genuine humility and, and, and is there to, to do the work of God and, and to understand that they're just doing what is their duty and privilege to do, God's the one that gets the glory, isn't it? Right. That's what happens in the story. David starts out, hey, I want to do this great work for God. Nathan says, do it. God comes to Nathan and says, go tell David, go remind him that I didn't ask for this, he's not doing me any favors, and that it was me that exalted him. And at the end of the story, David's saying, let thy name be magnified forever. You know, whatever we're going to accomplish in this life, whatever we're going to do for God, go over to 1 Peter chapter 4, we have to understand it's all to God's glory. <clears throat> and say, well, you know, I want some of the credit. Well, you know, God isn't going to reward us for our works. You know, but even if he didn't, we'd still be in heaven. <laughs> Even if God was like, you know what, just serve me and no rewards. I'd still do it, gladly. Amen. You know, I, I, I just, I, hey, rewards, that's just, that just is like, well, God is even better than that. God is even, God's good, and then it's like, well, God's even gooder, <laughs> right? <laughs> God is so good because he saved me, you know, and it's my reasonable service to just live for him. And he's going to reward me on top of that? Not because I deserve it. It's just because that's how good God is. Amen. And that makes me just want to magnify God's name even more. Right. That makes me want to just serve him even more. Amen. I mean, David didn't get to the end of this and say, well, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to do this, you know, and make sure I get the credit for it. Obviously, I'm worthy of all this. Say, no, who am I? And, you know, God is the one that ultimately is magnified by all this. When a person is just humble, genuinely humble, just is going to serve God the best that they know how, God's the one that gets the glory for whatever is accomplished. That's what he said. Let thy name be magnified forever. You know, and that's the attitude that we have to have in the Christian life. You know, whatever we're going to accomplish for God, if we have to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing, it's to God's glory, that God gets the glory. Not, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to serve God and people are just going to see how great I am. What a great Christian I am. 
you know, this church is going to do a great work, and everyone's just going to say, boy, that, you know, uh, Faithful Word Baptist Church Tucson, that's just the greatest church ever. Is that what we're in it for? To have some name? You know, I'm just going to sit down, I'm going to write this sermon, and it's going to get a a million views on YouTube. Look, I'll take the million views on YouTube. But I'm not going to sit down and try to write a sermon for that express purpose. You know, someone asked me that recently. Have you ever you ever written a sermon, like, thinking about how many views it's going to get? No. No. I will, I will turn that camera off forever. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I mean that. I honestly don't. You know what, Matt? You know what the most rewarding thing about this job is? Is you folks. Amen. Seeing the people, the, the, the changes that people make in this room. Seeing lives being changed in this room. You can't compare that to how many thumbs up I got or how many thumbs down I got I mean good night if that's that's a that's an exercise in futility practically anymore look and I'm not downplaying the importance of of putting the message out there look I've I've seen it firsthand we were out soul winning yesterday with Pastor Anderson I was out with him and I go up to this door and I knock this door and this guy I start talking to him and I and I ask him well what do you think a person got to do to go to heaven he's like you know Pastor Anderson's right here. He hasn't even looked at him yet. He goes, "Well, you know, salvation by grace through faith, not of works." And I'm like, "Yeah, amen." Ephesians two eight nine. Pastor Anderson, that's a good answer. That's what he said. Yeah, that's a good answer. The guy looked over. He goes, "His eyes get all big." You're on YouTube. <laughs> he goes, "Yeah." And he comes out and he's like, "Yeah, I watched your video." He got saved through uh, another channel, Good Hope. Anyone knows the Good Hope channel? He's got like a couple, like ten or ten thousand plus. Some, I don't know. He's got a lot of subscribers. This guy got reached through that guy's channel, gets saved, and then finds Pastor Anderson's preaching and watches, and he, but he has no idea that this guy, that Pastor Anderson is a pastor in Phoenix. And he's, and he's like, hey, the YouTube, he's like, YouTube came alive and came to your door, right? So I'm, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down YouTube. I mean, I've seen it first. I'm here because of YouTube, okay, because I found him on YouTube. That same guy, you know, he came out to church last night and got baptized. Amen. Why? Because of YouTube. So I'm all for YouTube, right? But that's not the motive behind it. You know, that's not the motive to try to make some big name for me or this church or be recognized. Look, it's to the glory of God. Amen. You know, that guy came out and got baptized. You know, he's going to, you know, has the potential to serve God with his life, to win other souls himself, get other people baptized. Who knows what? And God gets all the glory for all that, whatever that guy accomplishes, you know. And he has the ability to do it. He has the opportunity to do it. God could use them in a mighty way. <clears throat> so if they're in 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll, we'll wrap up here. It says in verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You know, that's a pretty important job. You know, hey, I'm speaking as the oracle of God tonight. You know, that, that alone, you know, is pretty satisfying. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. You know, God gives us the ability to minister accordingly. You know, we're not all going to do it the same. We're not all going to do it the same levels. We're not all going to fill the same positions. But whatever we, ability we have, you know, God's the one that gave us ability. And just make use of it, and God will be glorified through it. That God in all things may be glorified through Christ Jesus. You know, that's the point of serving God with our lives. You know, you say, what's the point of life? To glorify God. It's really that simple. What's the point of existing? Why are we here? Look, he... The Bible says that we are made for His pleasure. For His pleasure, God made us. You know, God didn't make us so we could just go around just entertaining ourselves, satisfying ourselves, and just here to entertain. You know, God made us for His glory, to glorify Him. So if we're going to serve God, you know, let's serve Him humbly. Let's serve Him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know, let's, let's serve Him. Why? So that He can be glorified in Christ Jesus. And, you know, we'll do that when we do that with genuine humility and when we do that understanding that, you know, whatever, uh, you know, however, to whatever degree God exalts us, it's God that exalted us, ultimately. And, you know, and if our intentions are to glorify God, you know, then God will honor that. I believe that. If our intentions are to glorify God in our lives, God will honor that and God will use us. That's what he did with David. That temple got built, folks. That, God didn't put the, didn't squash that. But he made sure, he said, look, we're going to build this. You're not going to, we know the story. We'll get into that later. It was Solomon that ended up doing it. But he said, you know what, David, I'm going to let you go ahead with this. I'll let you start laying the groundwork. We'll go ahead. We'll move forward with your idea because your intentions are right. Because you want to glorify me and you have genuine humility. Look, if we had the same attitude as David, real humility, right intentions, God will honor us too and he'll use us. 
to do great things for him and to his glory. Let's go ahead and pray.